Hello and thank you for joining us as we talk about Ireland. I'm Jim Bruce and recently I sat down with Dr Martin Manser to discuss his views on Ireland, past, present and future. Martin Manser is from an Anglo-Irish family with long-standing roots in Tipperary. His father, Nicholas Manser, was for many years a history professor at Cambridge University and the young Martin was born and raised in England. He spent school holidays in Ireland and, when he completed his education, he joined the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. Following several years as a diplomat, he left the civil service to become an advisor to three successive Fianna Fáil Taoiseach. He played a crucial role both in shaping government policy on Northern Ireland and in the discussions with Republican leaders that led to the IRA ceasefire in 1994 and, a few years later, the Good Friday Agreement. Between 2002 and 2011, he was a senator, a TD, a minister of state and a member of the Council of State. Currently, he is vice chair of the expert advisory group on commemorations and in 2018 he was elected to the Royal Irish Academy. He divides his time between his home in Dublin and the family farm in Tipperary. I first asked Dr Manser to reflect on the biggest changes he has seen over the course of his life. Well, there are three or four things. Um, First, there has been a vast improvement. I talk about a net improvement because in one or two areas that we'll talk about later, there have been disimprovements um, in the quality of life and standard of living of people. Um, When I was young, of course, the population was still declining. Um, uh, Today, it is expanding rapidly. Um, We made the breakthrough, I think, in the 1990s um, and since, and despite the setback of the crash, um, we've achieved at least average European living standards where uh, when we joined the EEC, we were only 60, 70 percent. Um, And we were definitely in a different league to uh, not just to Britain, but to the founder members um, of what's now the European Union. So uh, I think there has been um, uh, tremendous economic and social progress with some caveats. And what would you attribute that to mainly? Is it EU membership or is it something no, else? No, it, 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 it's, it's a combination of factors. Um, I remember confidence, I'm talking about economic confidence, coming to Ireland for the first time in the 1960s. Okay. Now, I'd have been a teenager and student, but I was following where, when I was at Oxford, the Oxford Union, I used to go every day and read the previous day's Irish Times and things like that. Mm. You know, Ireland, Ireland was definitely beginning to make progress and that was a prelude you to joining uh, joining the EEC. No, uh, sorry, you imply that the economic developments you talk about weren't entirely positive. There were so were there some any drawbacks that you you see? Well, I mean, the, the, the biggest the biggest drawback is in the nineteen sixties, when there was still huge poverty in Ireland. It was nonetheless the period when there was the lowest crime rate mm. over the century okay. from nineteen twenty two to twenty twenty. Um, and then, you know, in, particularly in the 80s, but perhaps even a bit before that, the 70s, you know, drugs came in and mm-hmm. that's the source of a lot of crime. And I've heard it said that for the first 20 years or so of that 70s through to the mid 90s, uh, the Guardi were so preoccupied with the internal security situation relating to the northern conflict mm-hmm. Uh, that they weren't able to bring their full resources to bear on the burgeoning burgeoning drugs problem. And I'd have to say I was a bit shocked um, seeing, uh, the, the one thing that has shocked me in this election so far is an advertisement from the Union of Students of Ireland, and one of their demands is decriminalisation of drugs, mm. cocaine, heroin, yeah. etc. Um, you know, I do wonder whether that is actually uh, the, the position of most students, but I accept I belong to an older generation <laughs> and um, uh, and so on. But as people have pointed out, um, uh, you know, there is some connection with horrific crimes that are happening on mm. the streets and... Um, um, uh, consumption by a, a, 
uh, a comfortable section of the population of, of, of hard drugs. So the, the, the situation prior to the economic advances that we made back in the 60s was, was, uh, was less crime-ridden. Oh, far less. And I mean, the statistics, 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 that, that was actually the lowest, mm. the, uh, the lowest period. But now if I'm talking about on, on progress, yes. I've always liked, um, you know, Lamas was asked, you know, what was the biggest step forward in his lifetime? And he said, uh, you know, the introduction of air transport mm. and connecting Ireland now, and originally that was Shannon um, yes. mainly um, uh, connecting. Now, even 30 years ago, say when we came back into government in 1987 and we were negotiating with the EU over structural and cohesion funds uh, and in tandem with the introduction of the single market, there was a lot of talk about peripherality. Mm, mm. You don't hear us complain much about peripherality these days. I mean, we are so well connected. I had to go uh, to give a couple of lectures in Philadelphia this autumn, able to fly direct to Philadelphia mm, mm, mm. from Dublin. You can fly to so many different places. Uh, then you've got the whole internet. Um, and I mean, communicate. I mean, re re remember we were we were struggling with the phone system, including pay phones. When I first worked with with, with Charlie Hawhey, um, for him to contact me when I was on holiday um, in the west of Ireland, um, uh, near Lettergesh, Letterfrack, um, the only way that could be contacted would be through the local post office. Mm. And, you know, I mean, all of that has just been completely transformed yes. and I think one of the good things that was done which is is, is rarely remembered um, when people uh, sort of condemn the policies that led up to the crash there were a lot of good things done in that I mean for example the provision of Ireland with a motorway network mm. which is hugely improved mobility mm -hmm. in, in in Ireland. I mean, nowadays, instead of spending three to four hours going to Tipperary, I can do it in sort of two, two and a quarter. Yes. And there's also an early train service, uh, and you know, double the number that there used to be, uh, you know, from Limerick Junction. Uh, so, I mean, there have been a lot of improvements uh, on, 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 on that front. And I think a lot of people attribute uh, correctly, give quite a lot of the credit to the um, introduction of free secondary education. Yes. And um, uh, you see, we now have today, now you will find some people who criticise this, but I wouldn't be one of them, uh, you know, about 50% of the population um, going through some form of third level. And... Um, um, uh, you know, that was a huge expansion. Now, I can remember in, and they were to a degree, austerity days in the late 80s. Mm. Um, you know, the IDA came to the Taoiseach, uh, that's Charles Hawhey, and made the case that, you know, we have to expand our third level education, mm. you know, beyond a sort of relatively small elite. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, that that, that, that was done and new mm. universities were founded in mm -hmm. Limerick and mm. DCU and uh, there were one or two more in the pipeline. And so I, th I think that had, uh, had a big... And f we also refined, and this would be something I would defend, and I think we still have the spirit with us, even if not the substance, is the whole system of social partnership. Yes. Um, now, uh, Charles Hawhey, he, he, I, I remember meeting him for the last time about a month before he died. Um, I think at the end of the day, he regarded social, now he died in 2006, social partnership as his greatest achievement in, in particular. Now, that started, or the, the precedence of that started under La Masse, even yes, when he was yeah. a minister, going back to the 40s. But, I mean, I suppose it gradually got refined through trial and error and probably eventually got a bit over-refined and therefore it wasn't, it wasn't as much help as it might have been uh, when, the, when the crash came. But. Now, you've mentioned a, a number of um, positive developments. Yes. The ones I've noted are the education, the free education, which came in, I think, in 1968 under Don O'Malley. Yeah. Uh, the motorway system, which is a more recent development. 
the, the opening up of the airlines and the yeah. travel between Ireland and other countries, yeah. social partnership, the phone system. And I would say with the, with the roads, I mean, improve public transport as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I go around the country, I get quite a lot of invitations, different things. If I can go by public transport, yes. generally speaking, I will. If I have to drive, I have to drive. Now, is there anything in particular, having gone through uh, a number of, of issues, are there any, is there any one thing that you would say is the most uh, significant positive development that you can put your finger on? Uh, well, I think back? despite everything, you know, we have... Now, I, I, guess I accept that some people, especially in the media, see this as a negative, not as a positive, mm. but I think we do have a high degree of political stability. Mm. Um, you know, there was an impressive unity, I'm not saying a total unity, but impressive unity both in dealing with the crash so that we got out of it as quick as we reasonably could rather than letting it drag on and get worse and worse, uh, which is a bit what happened in Greece for a long time. Um, but also dealing with, so far, with the Brexit challenge. Now, is that, is that political stability an innately Irish thing or is it something that had to be worked at? I mean, is it simply no, I, part I, of I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure that it's in a... In, in, in a, it's simply how we've how we've reacted to. We've always had, or nearly always had, pretty tight majorities, if majority mm. at all, uh, in the in, in the dial, which means in practice. Uh, if you're not to have constant elections, people have to work together. But does it mean that the Irish are kind of naturally calm and sensible anyway? And this is I, well, no, I'm, 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 I'm not going to attribute racial characteristics, but I, I think it's partly to, to, to do with size. I think yes. countries like Britain, like the United States, they feel that uh, they could afford to indulge in extreme partisanship, you oh, know, oh, which oh. we have seen evident over the last few years. Um, I think we realise that we're small and vulnerable and behaving like that um, uh, would do us a lot more damage. Oh, oh. Uh, so it's a, it's a question, a question of different, a different side and also most of the time a realism about what are realistic options. Now, I'll give you one or two counter-examples. Mm. The, the, when, when we have felt on top of the world, which was true in 2001, 2008, mm. remember when we voted no initially to the Nice and Lisbon Treaty? Yes. Um, I think that, and, and the farmers were saying we should veto the WTO pact as well. Mm. Uh, look, you know, we, we can manage fine, we can... And I remember... Um, uh, no, I, he was sort of uh, sort of um, Anglo-Irish background and also not, he had a base in Ireland but he was in the city of London and he said to me in or around the time, shocked me a bit in the uh, time of the Lisbon Treaty um, you know, why doesn't Ireland become independent and it was clear that he meant independent in the sense in which they Brexiteers understand oh, yes. the word independent you know um, but uh, of course for Ireland, that would mean effectively becoming an Anglo-American satellite. And, uh, and were we an Anglo-American satellite before we joined the? EC? No, well, I think what, what no, I think what is no because was, I mean America. I mean, it had a certain role in the Irish economy prior to the sixties, but you know tourism and things like that. Mm. But I no, I, I mean, I think the, the the American role came in from after we joined, more after we joined the. What about EC. Britain? Though we were quite. Well, well, Britain, you know, well, we, the, the, you see, the paradox is, is 1949 Declaration of the Republic, mm. leaving mm. the Commonwealth. That year, if you look at the trade statistics, uh, exports went 95% to Britain and Northern Ireland. And, of course, we kept mm. the sterling link for another 20, nearly 30 years. Yes, yeah. um, so, uh, you know, Lamas, when he became Taoiseach, he said, effectively, you know, political independence has been achieved. My project is economic independence. OK. Um, and that, of course, was the attraction of the EU. And, and I came across recently a pamphlet circulated by Jack Lynch, mm. 
prior to the referendum on EEC entry mm-hmm. in 1972. And the pitch was, uh, this will get us out of a situation of unnatural economic dependence, you know, where the terms of trade are largely dictated to us and Mm. so on. And then if you read Whitaker, his life of Whitaker by uh, Chambers, um, uh, the situation in the 1950s where even for agricultural produce, what would be let in at any given time, uh, you know, could be very arbitrary and it was sort of quite difficult uh, you know, uh, to plan ahead, plan ahead properly. Um, so I, I think nowadays I haven't looked at the latest statistics, but our exports are down to 12, 13, 14 percent to Britain, and our imports are nearly a third. That's different. Yes, yeah. But you know, if needs be, um, I mean, p- people like Little and Aldi have come on the market and so on. Um, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, consumer produce could could be could be shifted more in the European direction if we had to in terms of imports. You know? So, do you think that the strategy then uh, in the sixties leading up to the referendum was to, in a sense, uh, reduce our dependence on Britain by becoming closer to Europe and thereby? making a more balanced economy which was well I, 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 I think that's actually part of it but I think also initially mm. you know a lot of people sort of a, a chance to give a terrific boost to what was the main industry at that time agriculture right. and indeed in the 70s um, you know Irish farming uh, 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 did benefit greatly mm. but you see protectionism back in the first mm. uh, period um, you know that was an attempt to create more independence um, uh, uh, by creating some something of a domestic industrial yes, base. Yeah. Because you see, I mean, the theory, the economic theory of imperialism is this: um, is you extract raw materials mm. in Ireland's case, food, yes. um, um, and you send you send them your consumer products. Yes, yeah. um, and I think independence meant that we took a different economic path from what we would have followed if we had remained, you know, uh, more of a sort of uh, a a pastoral tourist economy Mm, mm. um, with a little bit of modern industry, but not 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 a huge amount of it. Uh, We had to build up an economy, an economy of our own. Can I ask you about something which which I, I think you're interested in, and that is the cultural dimension of Ireland after independence, because we were certainly not in great shape economically up until the 60s, but we were, as they say nowadays, punching above our weight as far as culture was concerned. But that was even pre-independence. Yes. And in fact, I see certain parallels, at least in terms of the period of time, between, say, the last decades of the whole of Ireland in the Union, Mm. or pre-independence, if you like, to put it that way, it's Janus headed, uh, and say the last decades of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, okay. which saw a terrific cultural flowering, yes. uh, or even 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 Russia uh, prior to uh, prior to the revolution. Um, so th- there's no doubt there was a sort of excitement in the air, and you can interpret it two ways. You mm. can uh, say that you know. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Celtic twilight was sort of the last gasp of Anglo Ireland, <laughs> or you can see it as a sort of presager of independence. That it 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 kind of like I mean, uh, did that uh, play of mine, as Yeats said, oh. uh, send out? Um, certain certain people to be shot, yes, you yes, know. Yes, yes. Um, so you could you could, you could, you can you can look at it, and I think I suspect both interpretations have a degree of validity mm. about it. Um, but no, I mean Ireland um, did, and it's, it's, it's for. Um, uh, you know, four Nobel Prize winners yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for, for, for literature, and it's right up to to modern times because with Seamus Heaney, while we were. As you say, in the doldrums uh, economically, we were producing people like Kavanagh and, and Behan, uh, Miles Nagapoline. We were producing people who seemed to be able to establish some kind of credentials yeah. for ourselves um, on the cultural stage. Well, I remember when I went to Germany as a diplomat in the um, mid-70s, mm. uh, being astonished at the number 
of plays by Irish authors that yeah. were on in provincial theatres not too far from Bonn. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, there was, uh, you know, tr- tremendous interest in 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 in, in, in um, Ireland culturally speaking. Yes, yeah, and it, but I wonder what you think about that cultural inheritance or that cultural heritage. Have we, in any sense, kept the balance right between? our cultural health and our economic health, or has one suffered at the expense of the other? Well, you see, I'm not sure that culture is at the command of government, you know. No. Um, I mean, yes, yes, uh, it, it can be funded and encouraged by government, but after that, um, uh, government and bureaucracies should, as far as possible, stand back. Mm. Um, um So, I don't know, it seems to me that Ireland is still a pretty culturally lively place. Um, And you you need a little bit bit of distance from a period in time um, uh, to to see exactly what's the significance of particular things Mm -hmm. and how long will they they, they Mm -hmm. be remembered in a generation's time or not, you know? You didn't mention um, Charles Hoy's initiative as far as the artists exemption is concerned and yeah. the well, attraction see, of people into the country from outside who are yeah. contributing well, as well I think you see he was um, I noticed a, an interview with um, uh, fellow miscreant uh, Sunday Business Post uh, uh, Michael Lowry uh, yesterday and he was asked at the end of the interview um, you know who, who in your observation was the most effective T-shirt you've witnessed, mm. and he said without hesitation, Charles Hawkey. Really, yeah. uh, and uh, he comes from a Fine Gael background, you know. <laughs> and um, was it for that reason? Or I, I mean, I, I do think, particularly in his last period, eighty-seven to ninety-two, he had a as perfect a command as it's possible to get of the levers of power. He knew how to get mm. things done. Now, okay. Uh, some of it would have been um, uh, by, um, you know, methods we might not approve of today. Like, um, you know, I would be sitting in his office. Um, most of his phone calls lasted no more than 30, 45 seconds. Mm. And on uh, one occasion, he'd finished a call of that type and uh, he waved the phone at me and he said, uh, this is my weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we've talked about the positive side of, of our recent history. Can I mention at least briefly uh, to others? I mean, yes. ob- obviously, yeah. um, the peace process, yes. which hopefully has resolved not merely the recent conflict or indeed the conflict of the last hundred and more years, but also f- find a method so that we will not go back to conflict. Mm. Um, and provided people are reasonably sensible and constructive, I'd, I'd be reasonably confident uh, that that has been achieved. And I mean, mm. uh, certainly during the recent Brexit debate, uh, there's a Good Friday Agreement has been centre stage 30 years mm. afterwards. Mm. And, you know, that's not always the case that things mm. uh, that... Um, peace agreements endure that well, you know. I mean, look at Versailles, for example, 20 years afterward, another world war. Um, So, um, you know, that gives a good deal. And you see, and I'm young enough to remember um, uh, the... uh, I'd been in my early 20s when the troubles broke Mm. out. Mm. And we were down in, in, in August 69, we were down having a week's holiday rented villa in Barley Cove, oh, yeah. West Cork. Yes. And we'd go up to the... I mean, they didn't have televisions in those days, but there was in the hotel. And we went up each night into the sort of crowded lounge of the hotel as everybody looked at the sort of laces development in the north. And I think this was the period, you know, when the British troops came in. Mm. And my father, who was a historian, he said to us... Um, the IRA will be back. Mm. 
and uh, my brother and myself argued with him and said, um, you know, no, no, Dad, this is different. You know, this is civil rights yes. and, um, uh, and so on. And, you know, thought to ourselves, well, he may be an expert on the 1920s, but mm. he's not such an expert on what's happening now. Yes. But, of course, he was right and we were wrong. Mm. <laughs> yes. Sadly. Yes. <laughs> um, but, um, so, I mean, I'd seen it right, right the way through through and I was there at the kind of the beginning stages of the peace process in the late 80s when I was I met Father Reed of the Redemptorist mm. Monastery in Clonard and uh, we had our first meetings in 88 uh, with the Republican leadership uh, Jerry Adams and so on and then later I got into a closer encounter with Martin McGuinness 92 to 94 and that was probably you know the most important uh, most important thing uh, that I did because, as you know, the um, uh, political w wisdom was, uh, you know, Democrats don't talk to terrorists. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, nowadays, of course, the conventional wisdom is completely different, mm -hmm. but uh, that was the way it was uh, uh, then. Uh, but I found it sort of my surprise uh, when I think back that... Um, uh, you know that I, when I was young I could hardly have anticipated that my most important work would be done in a redemptorist monastery <laughs> um, or uh, that uh, I would effectively uh, be engaged uh, with the IRA leadership mm -hmm. now of course having my father as a historian um, I think probably helped from all sorts of points of view. A lot of things in Ireland, though, were a republic, like a lot of, and a lot of other republics, is hereditary. Yes. People sort of maybe assume that um, if, if a previous generation had expertise in an area with any luck, it would have rubbed off on, yeah. <laughs> on the offspring or one of them anyway. Mm. Um, but anyway, no, his work was, of, um, my, my father's work was, 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 was of great help. Well, you you brought an historian's perspective to bear. I would imagine. well, in part, yes, yeah, yeah. In, in, in 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 part. Um, so anyway, the, I mean, the the, the peace peace process yes. was. A, now, I suppose um, uh, you know a, another um, welcome thing, though the way it's the way it's been done has been important. Is uh, you know the liberalisation of Irish society mm. uh, from. Uh, you know, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. I mean, I, I, I can remember. Uh, now, you see, in, in, in the 1950s, you know, as a member of a minority, provided you respected boundaries, yes. you were fine. Mm, mm. The problem only arose, you know, as in Feathered on Sea and so yes, on, yeah. if if boundaries if boundaries mm -hmm. got uh, sort of blurred in other words uh, if you knew your place is that uh, well, well if you do you know, yeah but you see the difference between say the Protestant minority in the south and the Catholic minority and particularly the upper echelons of that thing is we were not more deprived than those around us mm -hmm. I mean, arguably, uh, despite everything, despite revolution, despite in land ownership and all the rest of it, you, you were still more privileged than most of those around yes, you. Yeah. And that's totally different from, say, if you lived in the bog side yes, or West yeah, or, or, yeah, or, or yeah. Westbrook. So, I mean, I I take a fairly... But, I mean, given given all that happened in Irish history, I take a pretty benign view yes um and you know most members of that community not all but most um uh found ways of uh, uh, getting stuck in and you know making themselves useful and so on and um um i'm pleased i've been able to do that myself <laughs> so the peace process is a clear um positive development over the last yeah particularly particularly as it was unexpected now you see this is this is where i would regard the key period in my life i was born in 1946 we're mm. now talking in early 2020 was in the middle 
in the sort of 98, 89, 90s. Now, if you look, look, look at what happened. The Iron Curtain fell. Yes. Germany was united. Now, remember, I had mm. been posted to Bonn yes. for two and a half. So I, I took, and still do, I read Der Spiegel every week, mm. take a keen interest in, 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 in Germany, um, as I do also in France, because I had a French um, uh, research subject. Um, and then you had the ending of apartheid mm. in South Africa. Mm. And remember, the second country that Mandela came to when he was released in February 1990 was Ireland. I think the first one was was it was it was it Sweden or Norway? One of the one or other that's been very 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 helpful. And we were the se- we were the second country mm. that mm. he visited because we'd had a very active Irish anti-apartheid yes. movement. And then you see, and the message that those sent was. Um, look, problems that we never expected to see solved in our lifetime, intractable problems like the division of Europe, the Iron mm-hmm. Curtain, mm-hmm. divided mm-hmm. Germany, apartheid in South Africa, hey, they actually can be solved. They can be problems. And the, the, additionally, in the case of Europe, with the exception of Romania and, of course, the former Yugoslavia, which was not strictly speaking part of the Soviet uh, empire, um, you know, it was non-violent. I mean, the bicentenary of the French Revolution, you had a peaceful revolution despite vast arsenals of weapons mm. um, on, on both sides. I mean, that was human progress. So th- in Ireland, people said, well, look, if they can do it to intractable problems, I mean, the pessimistic view is there are some problems to which there are no solutions. Mm, mm. And people were beginning to say that about Ireland um, and that the conflict would go on into the... I mean, there's an expert I knew who wrote a history of the IRA, several hundred pages, called J. Boyer Bell, from the, from, he mm. lived in New York. Um, he published something in 1992. Now, he wasn't aware of what was going on under the surface. Uh, and he, he saw it, as did many unionists, the conflict going on more or less indefinitely. The, and the international influence was important. It was, it was important. That's what I want to ask you. Uh, you it, it how, how big a factor were, were these precedents? Well, I think... Uh, well, well, well a, a, they showed it could be done. But mm. then you see, and this is also important, the... You know, the communist political and economic model effectively imploded, certainly mm, in, mm, in, in, mm. In, in Europe. Now, I know you could say it's revived in China and so on. Um, but, I mean, that was certainly a great help in South Africa because the ANC suddenly was not going to be introduce an enforced communist regime. And mm-hmm. I think that was probably one of the critical elements that allowed a breakthrough to take place there, the fact that the Soviet the, the Soviet mm. threat was it was was imploding. Now you see, you you've got to remember. I mean, there'd be quite a few minority political forces um, uh, in Ireland that uh, also saw kind of Marxist socialism as mm. Uh, mm. Uh, as the as the way of the future, and um, uh, you know, including some in Sinn Fein, obviously in the Workers' Party, yes. uh, and and so on, and uh, and that 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 was removed out of the equation. So you see, Brook was then able to make his public statement uh, that Britain has no selfish strategic, yeah, yes, political yeah, yeah. Uh, or economic interest yeah. in Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, sort of to knock the idea that you could find in, say, um, defence papers in the late 40s and yeah. 50s is, uh, you know, Northern Ireland is vital to us, we can't let go of it even yes. if the people want, you see. So, um, but anyway, uh, effectively, the Northern, Northern Ireland had ceased in the, you know, the, 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 the present day world mm. to, to have any major strategic significance. That's it for part one. My conversation with Martin Manser concludes in part two.